Kingsfield, a game of swords and sorcery, might and magic. I've beaten Kingsfield 2, known simply as Kingsfield in the West, using only spells. Now it's time to repeat the experiment on the original Japan-only game, using a fan translation. This is from Software's first game. While it is very dated, I don't think it's aged that poorly. So how does KF1 differ from its sequel? Do mechanical variations make this challenge easier or harder than KF2? Will the original put up more or less of a fight in the end game? So let's take a look at the world we'll be delving into, or rather, delving under. An ancient accord between humans, elves, and forces unknown, possibly divine. Old sites of worship, long since forgotten over millennia. An absent king, thought to be dead, seeking the occult. Monsters spew forth from the catacombs. Hauser, swordmaster to the king, goes to investigate. Not a word since, and that's where we come in. While getting a spell in Kingsfield 2 wasn't particularly hard, we actually begin with the Light Needle spell in the original game. A quick projectile in the Holy Element costing a meagre two magic points. This is all we have to defend ourselves with as we enter the graveyard. Oh yeah, if there weren't enough graveyards for you in 2, the entire of this game takes place in the Royal Cemetery. It wouldn't be a challenge run if it was easy. I'll show you how useful the spell is at the beginning. I can kill one of the weakest enemies. Barely. And that's it. Where this first game differs is the stones. Bloodstones and moonstones have no purpose in Kingsfield, Japan, other than being sold for money. So, just like in the last video, our first mission is to get the fountain up and running. Every game in the series has one a place to restore our health and magic, in the very first area of the game. And like the second game, we need to activate this one too. The reason this one's out of service is some meddling fool took a goblet away from its proper place. We can find our precious chalice in the arms of his corpse at the end of a cave. It's not too far in, and by picking our moments we can walk past the enemies and retrieve it. Fortunately for us, the enemy's pathfinding in KF1 leaves something to be desired. Enemies often won't chase you down, or sometimes they just revolve on the spot. Amusing, maybe, but you won't be laughing when the projectiles come your way. So we've got our little cup. Now to return it, which involves delving into a slightly deeper cave, but it's the same again. A casual stroll past plants and scorpions. We arrive at the Dragon Temple, and on this unassuming little shelf, there's something that looks like a bus relief of a dragon. After that minor clue, we place the chalice down, and hear the sound of running water in the distance. The fountain is active, and we can now kill things. Okay, okay, look. Why is the fountain off-center? This has always bothered me, and now it's active, it's just rotating on the spot. Why? How? Leveling up is vital. Killing enemies gains us levels, which increases both our strength and magic stats. However, dealing magic damage will also increase the magic stat. So over time, our character Jean, or Jean, will develop an affinity with magic. It's similar to leveling skills in the Elder Scrolls. Every shot I land leads to me becoming more powerful. Just one or two enemies slain from the adjacent cave, and a return to the fountain is necessary. What choice do I have but to grind off camera? What's up guys? I did some grinding off camera. We're now at level 1 million. Don't forget to smash- With each level, our max MP increases, so we have more shots per trip to the fountain. Eventually, skeletons made for better targets, as they're weak to the holy power of our little pew-pew needle. Now we're powerful enough to take out one of these tree enemies, although it takes our full meter to do it. I feel confident enough to start exploring, and near the Dragon Temple we can find the Light Family Key, guarded by spiders. It's one of two keys we need to really open out this floor. So how many floors are there? Five. 
Kingsfield is a straight-up dungeon crawler, an experience like Ultimate Underworld brought convincingly to consoles for the first time. As we're in the Royal Cemetery, it makes sense for there to be some kind of church. A gloomy underground affair with a few pews in some side room. Because... because it's from software. The priest stands and preaches to nobody. He's lost his golden cross, so we've got to go get it for him. The ripped, shirtless altar boy in the back room can't help us. Also, there's only one bed between the two of them. Just saying. Progress is often frustrated by roadblock enemies like another tree, forcing me to come back with a full magic bar. If you don't like backtracking, it's safe to say this challenge is not for you. Why am I like this? This dodgy bloke is the other merchant in the game, both of them being on the first floor. He's got hold of the priest's cross, and I don't have enough money because I spent it on armour. Fortunately, there's one bony boy around the corner who's guarding an empty chest. Hang on. You're not going to fool me, or my memories of playing the game through before. A bastard sword. Fucking bastard. We can sell that to buy the cross. Giving the cross back to the priest earns us the graveyard key we need to progress. I labelled this area the Northern Catacomb. It's quite spooky. This skeleton even walks through a wall. But that's not a bug, it's a feature. Hidden doors in KF1 are simply fake walls you can walk through. That guy just showed me the way to the switch room. This is how to complete floor one. Turn this off and an arrow trap near the beginning is deactivated. We can now progress to the second floor. We descend to the second level. We meet our only companion for the lower depths. Eric says there's trouble down there. There's trouble up here. All enemies are tougher, even the same plants and skeletons. The treasury. Full of the original lizard men who prove rather tough, I took a big risk to rush in and grab the truth mirror, which gives us lore and the names of enemies, but I didn't really need it, at least not now. So let's do some exploring. The Knight's Graveyard. Here's where the FromSoft tradition of pendulum hazards begin. At least you can turn them off in Kingsfield. Hallways full of undead, but this rockman catches my eye. He doesn't seem to fit. The golems have their own chamber within this area, and they're guarding something. Not guarding it very well. So we get the Earthstone, one of four thingamies we need to progress later on. So I have a goal right now, and that's to get a powerful item which makes this run possible. It's on the third level, but we can't get there because of this ravine. We need a way to cross. After dodging some more enemies, I found myself blocked by a head-eating plant. And you can see how underpowered I am. This is a serious problem. We find a blind harpist hiding in the corner of the cave. Man's just rocking back and forth, is he alright? Fuck knows how he got here, but he offers to trade us his harp for a dragon tree fruit. A DTF, if you will. The harp activates a stone bridge, taking us across the ravine and down to level 3. Level 3 is where the magic happens. It's the focal point of my whole playthrough. I need that magic frickin' sword or I'm never gonna get anywhere. The floor's main feature is the Tower of Prayer, a structure with four locks requiring the four seal stones. But unbeknownst to many, there's a powerful hidden weapon that's good for the whole game. We make our approach and find the path blocked by tougher variants of the Earth Golems. This is partly down to luck. It just happened to be in the way. Maybe I can just... Nope. Okay, one down. We use the phantom rod to show any hidden walls. It's a bit further up, but I'm trying to remember where it is. Can't get past this guy. Spunk my MP just taking one out, and the other one gives me more than a bloody nose. This is a serious problem, but I need the sword, so we've got to try again.
This time they line up perfectly and we're through. Behind an illusory wall, there's another illusory wall. There it is. The Triple Fang. Constant health and MP regen. I can't imagine this challenge without it. I'm blocked in again, so have to fight my way out. Just waiting for two MP to come back to fire one more spell. Jesus. Finally, we escape with our precious Triple Fang and can now return to finish off the rest of level two. I'm a bit more confident with the MP regen and can really clear out the Knight's Graveyard and explore the cave where I found the harp, picking up the precious Verdite Stone, something that increases our magic damage. I met this chap who dislikes the world and so decided to live in a graveyard and pursue an investigation of truth. I disagree, man. You won't find your answers in some cave. That's my job. Why not live somewhere pretty, like a Zen master on top of a mountain, instead of in some dirty hole? We need to get into the jail, but a head-eater plant has the key. Therein lies the problem. Our little needle spell sucks. Spells are harder to come by in this game. We'll have to brave the third floor once again. So it's back round the tower, and into the pit with these lizards. And holy shit, I almost died. This is rough. I squeezed past this guy and now I'm boxed in and getting battered. Hello, lizard. Hello, you stinky lizard. No, he's poisoned me too and I still have to wait for my MP to come back. Help me. Yes! Fuck you, stinky lizard. I just, I just want to get to the other side of this corridor. Verdite. Man, I hope that was worth it. Right. After a quick breather, we can move on and get what we came for. Awaiting us up ahead is the former king of Verdite, or one of them. It's really easy to lose track of the lore, and I don't know why he seems to be in stasis and not quite dead. Hey, thanks for the fireball magic, Randolph. Now we're deep in enemy territory, we're underleveled and need to escape. Taking the long way round, rushing past lizards until we find a drop-off point, back to the beginning of the floor. I realise now I should have bought a dragon tree fruit earlier so I could have death warped back to the fountain. We can see our new spell already provides a clear increase in firepower. Now we're back on safer floors, I sell off the stuff I'm not going to use and buy a bunch of healing items and some DTF. Also, we check in at the chapel again, see if they're saying anything new- What? Just three fireballs to kill a tree on floor two. We're becoming more powerful. We're looking for a key to the jail now because we're trying to meet a special someone. Sorry, dungeon key, not jail key. I suppose it's a dungeon in the traditional sense of the word. Pretty straightforward, we get a bit more magic levelling in while clearing the place out and find the fairy. She gives us a warning and beseeches us to find her deeper with if- <laughs> My people need me! <laughs> Whee! She left us the green dragon rod, which teleports us to the beginning of a given floor. We're now geared up and can return to really explore the third floor. There's something I really like about the Tower of Prayer here. It's this chasm to the west. KF1 can't have any level geometry on top of another, so verticality is a rare sight. This infinite expanse of grey wall leaves a sense of scale rarely seen in this game. So we place the earth seal, but we still need to find the fire and wind seals to unlock this tower. This time we take it to the lizards. Well, that was stupid. Now we have no MP again. Just beyond them, we grab the fire seal stone and head back a bit. The former king mentioned looting his family tomb, so let's do that. The only thing worth mentioning is this rapier, or as the game calls it, Kolishmart. Kolishmart? 
Colishmel. Its true power will be unlocked later. We now retread the place we escaped after getting the fireball and come across the stone faces. They just vomit wind cutters out endlessly. Moving on, we find demons. They're guarding the wind seal stone, the final key to unlocking the tower. But a bit more exploration reveals more demonic foes behind two illusory walls, quite easy to miss. It gets hairy in here, and I use one of my precious fruits to restore MP. One of them drops a bracelet, and simply picking it up gives us wind magic, the return of our trusty sonic boom. What's cool here is the game's recognised our affinity for magic, and the class page now refers to us as wizard. I'll take it. We place the stones, and the central stone pillar of the tower descends, I suppose. We don't get to see it, but we can now pass through. The next level gives us a warm welcome. Punched in the back of the head by a fist of rock. Jesus, that's so harsh. Alright, check out this music. Huh? Huh? So you know how the hinter tombs in Bloodborne continue to be excavated by reanimated creatures? Well, that's what's going on here, with all these golems. This is a new construction by the Dark Magician, who had the ear of the king. It's some Isengard shit, you know what I mean? The sense of decor is a bit lacking, I'll give you that. So let me spin around and show you the hallways. This is what we need to navigate. The word crossroads doesn't even describe it, and there's four of these things. At the first uh, intersection, yeah, we see the projected form of the Dark Magician, who calls us out for our lack of magic power, which, you know, I take personally, you know. Intersection 2, and we see him again, and he takes some pleasure informing us that our father is in fact dead. Oh. At length, we arrive at the save point in what looks like the original construction, and see our old pal from earlier, apparently in desperate need of medical help, which we cannot give him because video games. We then check the other side and find a small room with a floating rock that does laps around the outside. I have to risk concussion to get my hands on the magician's map, which makes navigating a damn sight easier. I was really happy just to see a change in enemy type with these jumpy boys. Two more of these blasted intersections reveal that floor 4 is a long linear gauntlet that opens out once you reach the end of the ordeal. We had earth golems, now we've got iron ones too. One curio is the Shadow Blade, which might have been helpful if we were ever using physical attacks, but if you equip it, your world goes dark. A cruel trick this series likes to play. Everyone's gangster till they reach Saturn Shrine Earth Star, whatever the hell that means. You've seen the Mud Golems, you've seen the Steel Golems, now it's time for Golden Golems, who hit like trucks. Lining them up to hit both with wind cutter is still satisfying. At the north end, a battle awaits us. Three golden boys are off to a rocky start. Please forgive the menu spamming I had to do to heal myself. Our prize is the final key, which opens basically everything. Also, the magic stat increase gave us a new spell, the firewall which is similar to the same from KF2, but, well, look at it. It does the job, so we move on. No, we don't. One door is a mean trick, but on the other side, we come across the grave of our character's father with an unassuming greatsword. Looks like it's made of stone. Well, I'll take it, I guess. Right, time for revenge. The evil magician was involved with our dad's death somehow, so we walk in and hit him with firewall, and it beats his first form way quicker than I anticipated. The thing is, he hit me with darkness first, so I can barely see him drill into the ground and show his true face. I had to walk right up to him so we can get a decent look. Well, he's no Necron, let's say that. 
I have a problem with the fan translation calling him an evil dark magician. One adjective is enough. Secondly, magician sounds to me like a performer. Someone doing sleight of hand tricks at kids parties. It doesn't suggest actual power like wizard or mage does. Now we can go on a little Verdite tour, opening locked chests we passed before and a shortcut back to the first floor where we find the twin dragon ring which increases our magic stat by a respectable 8 points. We started this game so very weak, but towards the end our damage snowballs, a runaway train of magical destruction. On floor 4, the endlessly respawning golems keep us fed with experience. I'm looking for magic numbers. 60 strength, 85 magic, unlocks the hidden ability of the Kolishmar rapier. In Kingsfield games, certain weapons function as catalysts for spells. Hit attack, and follow up with the magic button with precise timing. Results may vary from weapon to weapon. The Kolishmard gives a rapid fire barrage of light needles, more than enough to kill anything that moves. We're ready to descend to the final floor. The music tells us what's up as soon as we land. Damn. Lightning Bolt. The last little grind we did gave us the Lightning Bolt, enough to one-shot enemies even down here. What I like about this floor is the pure chaos. Enemies throw out AoE spells that can melt you instantly. There's explosions everywhere, and even instant death pits lost in the source. I can't always use the rapid fire spell because if I have the Kolishmard equipped I don't recover magic. Although we have enough dragon fruit at this point that we don't need to worry about MP anymore. What is this spike ball here for? What is the point in that? <laughs> it's a confusing layout down here but it's a small area and soon enough we find a save point and a dragon door, but this one is open. It's the fairy again, and a dragon that may seem familiar, even if his story wasn't written yet. What follows should be of interest to any FromSoft fan. You were at our side all along. The Moonlight Sword, its first iteration in any game no less. Come on, we've got everything now, surely? Well, not quite. I really want to feel powerful, so we're going to visit the other sealed doors throughout the world and get the forest armour. The Moonlight Sword regens health and magic like the Triple Fang, but even faster. Fully geared up unstoppable. We head back down to the deepest floor. What more do the catacombs have to throw at us? The classic. Big versions of old enemies. Further in there's some more powerful versions of the demon lords. They can still catch you unawares. One of the kings is petrified? I, I don't know. And finally, the source of evil materialises, endlessly chilling with his stone-faced bros. Some big evil tree. He reminds me of the Icon of Sin from Doom 2, a static entity in the wall that summons enemies. Except this guy is more about the projectiles. I feel like Lightning Bolt would be enough, but let's pull out the Machine Gun spell. 
it actually stuns him. He can barely throw a move out. We've torn out this evil tree, root by root, leaving us to make out with the faces. <coughs> leaving back through the teleporter gets us the end credits. So to summarise how this game went, the beginning magic only is very tedious. Finding the triple fang was difficult, but towards the end we became so powerful that nothing posed a threat anymore. All in all, this was different to how Kingsfield 2 went. Well, there you have it. From Software's first game, and the Legend of the Moonlight Sword begins. But surely using the Moonlight Sword is the best way to finish the game. Alright. I loaded my save and went back to grinding. We need to see the Moonlight Sword's full potential. Once I hit certain stats, 80-80, we can cast the sword magic that the Moonlight Sword is known for. Let's take on the boss one more time. Thank you so much for watching. Kingsfield 3 is next. An epic journey and the conclusion to the trilogy. We'll meet again someday soon.